Good morning to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com here Monday now, the 22nd day of April 2024. A lot to talk about with you. I don't think it's going to be long now, and we're going to start seeing at least the signs of what's probably coming for this hurricane season. A lot of energy out there, a lot of potential. We've seen it. We've heard about it. Now we need to start looking more as we get into May, but hey, look, May is not that far off, a little bit more than a week away, and uh, things could start happening. We're going to discuss that, at least I'll tell you my thoughts on it, and our new hail project begins. We're going to go out to the Midwest this week, and we're going to study hail where normally hail happens. Of course, we just had Rock Hill and elsewhere in South Carolina get nailed by some big hail. We'll look at that as well, all right? Lots to talk about. First, sea surface temperature anomalies. Did you notice last week we had a Saharan air layer outbreak through here? And there was some talk about it out on social media. It helped to knock down those anomalous temperatures just a little bit. But lo and behold, the Saharan air layer has dissipated for the most part. And now the water temperatures are rebounding. And this is a big part of why we're expecting a significant hurricane season. Here we have the makings of our La Nina starting to come in, just barely getting there. But the big thing is no El Nino. You knock that El Nino out, and that paves the way for a very busy season ahead because of all of this very warm water relative to average, the warmest we've ever seen it relative to average this time of year. We're still above all of those records, even if it's just a little bit. Here's an interesting post here from Danilo. This is very uh, informative. This is a nice graphic from Tropical Tidbits. The reds are anomalous wind flow from the west. And let me stop the animation here. This goes out to May 5th, and then there's 6th and 7th. Look at this. This is your westerly wind, and that's not generally where it comes from. Normally, we get easterlies through here. You reverse the flow. You help to warm the waters of the eastern Atlantic, and that's the next post that Danilo made. We can already see that happening here. Let's highlight it in yellow. Up, 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 we're starting to go. This is when we had the Saharan air layer outbreak. We chiseled off some of that warmth. You let off the brakes of those easterly winds a little bit and all that dust. Boom, temperatures are starting to go back up. This will be an interesting thing to track and in a week. And, I, you know, I do this update weekly. Watch how this warms next week at this time all right what about actual temperatures and why am i concerned about things getting started early the gulf is warming normally there's nothing really alarming about i mean it's just typically above normal this time of the year anyway because we're just in that pattern but this is where i could see something developing later in may outside of the normal realm of hurricane season although right now water temperatures there's 25 celsius So about 78, 79 Fahrenheit, not quite warm enough for tropical activity yet. Now the good news is, on one hand, anything that develops in this area, typically early on, May, kind of late May into June, those are usually big rainmakers. Although, we always need to understand that rain is a major impact. Very similar to hail being sort of left out of the equation from people's minds, oh, that's the tornadoes with severe weather, Rain often gets left out of the equation when people think about tropical systems. What's the category is what everybody wants to know. Same thing with severe weather. Where are the tornadoes going to be? And certainly from a safety perspective, that is a great question. But you have to think about hail with severe weather as an impact. And you have to think about rain with tropical systems as a significant impact. And normally in the early part of the season, we get big rainmakers. So that's what we'll be watching for. Off the Atlantic area, mid-Atlantic and elsewhere, from Hatteras south, not bad. Water temperatures climbing. A little bit cool right now. We've had some westerly winds coming across with some of this anomalous, weird weather that we've just had. Uh, North of the Gulf Stream, though, look at that temperature gradient in there. Still very, very cold, but it's also April. Let's look at this again in a month, and then a month after that, and so forth. I'm not real concerned about anything early season in the Atlantic, or at least on the eastern seaboard. It's more the Gulf of Mexico, and I'll explain more as to why in just a minute. But look, for right now, we have westerly winds pretty much everywhere in the upper levels. So no, there's nothing out there. I'm not trying to hype something up that's not there, because it's not there. 
We don't have any big tropical waves coming through. There's nothing to worry about right now. My concern is once we get into May, especially mid-May and beyond, that somewhere in this region we start to get active. From a climatological perspective, water temperatures will certainly be warm enough by then. And you start to develop that Central American gyre that can sometimes set up in here. And you might get a convectively coupled Kelvin wave that comes through just a little area. You know, a couple of days in length in terms of duration around this area where things just become favorable. You get more convergence with these convectively coupled Kelvin waves. The air comes together at the surface. You get more moisture, uh, a reduction in wind shear. It's just like this pocket that comes through uh, usually two to three days long in terms of its duration. And you can get development. And that typically starts to happen in mid-May and beyond. And that's only about three weeks out. So you're darn right. I want to make sure we're talking about it. And we stay ahead of this, okay? Uh, vorticity, again, not much to worry about out there right now. I mean, nothing, honestly. Little pocket right here, no big deal. That's the frontal boundary. That's a mid-latitude storm. This is some little doodad out of the Atlantic. Nothing to worry about. But this is going to be our friend right here, this product right here, the Vorticity product from the University of Wisconsin. That's what we're going to really start to watch. I'll show you this again as we get into May. And watch what happens. You get all this kind of stuff here. This energy starts to lift farther and farther to the north. And then the tropics down here start to open up as we watch for these areas of Vorticity to coalesce and aggregate that energy, bundle it up, and we're off to the races. But nothing right now. Now, this is pretty interesting. This is the June climatological map from the National Hurricane Center. They don't have one for May, uh, even though we've had development in May. Now, we do have on our site, our insider site, an archive of all tropical activity. A good friend of the project, uh, Howard, over in Bermuda, coded that up for us. I'm going to show you that on May 1st. Let's just wait, and I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to remind you. Again, we do have activity that has happened in the Atlantic in May. I know you know but I want to prove it to you. I want to remind you. Uh, but this is interesting. This is June. Let's take me away so we can focus on the map. I'll outline it in red. This is where I am most concerned about through here. This is more El Nino type stuff. It's not impossible in a season like this early on. That's usually frontal development. You get something or maybe a, a piece of energy of Vortmax comes off the United States like Arthur 2014 Danny came around as a mesoscale system in 1997, but those were El Nino years. 97, definitely. 14 was certainly a warm Enso year, I believe. I think this is going to be different. I think we're going to have to really focus on this area through here in mid-May and beyond. But this is the June map, just for comparison. All right, hail. Look at this. This is from Brad, by the way, posting and reposting stuff from folks up in Charlotte, the Rock Hill area rocked by a big hail. You saw the pictures, the videos, I'm sure. That's just crazy. And so you bet, this definitely has me very interested, and I'll explain further as we move along. So big hail in the Rock Hill area, I-77 people trapped out there. Look at that Hyundai. I mean, is that Reed Timmers or what? Like, wow, that must have been frightening, especially if you were not expecting it at all. And I guess you could say it literally came out of nowhere. Look at these hail swaths here through parts of South Carolina. And then the, some of this got into North Carolina as well. We even had a little bit of small hail here in the Wilmington area. Fox weather, yep, talking about it Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then it's going to go on into the weekend after that, you know, deeper into the weekend in the nation's midsection. And we are going to be out there using this. Yes, it's finally here, the Hale Project. A real picture, not AI-generated. I'll show you an AI-generated image in a minute. Uh, basically, about a year ago, I had this idea. I was out there with CJ, one of our good friends, and we were trying to figure out our role studying weather in the nation's midsection. We do testing of equipment. You know, it's a good warm-up. But also, how can we contribute to the overall science and education and whatever, and not just be in the way? And a lot of people go after the tornadoes, and I totally understand that. And we have to avoid these hail cores. And I thought, you know, is there a way that we could study hail right in those hail cores and not get our vehicle completely destroyed? 
and this is the answer. We crowdfunded a hail guard that covers almost the entire important parts of my Toyota Tacoma. The hood, we're going to use these big quick dam for flood protection, right? They get water activated, so they're very squishy and thick. We're going to layer those across the hood, bungee those down when we get in those big hail cores and protect the hood. And even the headlights down there, we got the brush guard, but look, that's exposed. And a, a replacement headlight, that's got to be north of $1,000. We're going to put a quick dam in there. It's going to be like a water pillow. Pretty cool, huh? Flood mitigation product we're going to use for hail. Can't wait to tell them all about it. They're going to be excited up there in Rhode Island um, how we're going to use their product in a different kind of way. And then the rest of the vehicle is pretty much protected. Wind-driven hail, that could still be a problem. Look, we're not 100%. We're not driving a Humvee. The military didn't donate. That'd be great, but they probably don't get very good mileage, and I don't think they have AC, but whatever. Um, they're built for war, not for hail and comfort. But they would do well in hail, that's for sure. So we got a company here in Wilmington to build this for us, custom-made. Edwards Incorporated, they do crane work and fabrication and other stuff. And they custom-built this hail guard so that we can get out in it. And we call it the Hail Project. It doesn't have to be a weird sounding. It's just a cool, simple name, the Hail Project. So what are we going to do? Well, there's the AI-generated vehicle in the background. I had to have something. We don't have a picture of us there yet, but that'll change later in the week, believe me. But we call these expeditions, and we're going to go out there, and the nature of the Hail Project is very simple. Just like rain is underappreciated by the general public, as a major damaging and even life-threatening impact in tropical systems, hail, I think, and I mean it is true, is an underappreciated, misunderstood, often overlooked part of severe weather. You get your slight, your enhanced, your moderate, your high-risk days for severe weather. Everybody loses their mind. They go out and they're chasing and they're looking for tornadoes. Again, that's fine. No problem. But the hail gets ignored by most people. Not everybody. IBHS is out there, in, uh, the Institute for Business Home Safety, and there's different chasers that focus on it. You know, often, you know, it's, it's more hit or miss, right? I wanted something that is dedicated to it. So we call it the Hail Project. What are we going to do? We're going to measure, observe, report, all that kind of stuff, catalog, and we're going to run experiments on top of the Tacoma on this amazing system that we have had built for us right there we can mount all kinds of experiments to see how hail trajectories are using GoPros, slow-mo, uh, we can put everyday household items up there. Eventually we're going to solicit you to send us stuff. What do you want to see put up there and have it tested against hail? And we're going to have fun with it too. Basically this is like a giant pegboard. These are half inch holes, it's a perforated aluminum top and we can mount whatever we want up there while protecting the vehicle from most of the big hail. So that gives us an opportunity to study how hail does what it does. The acoustics of it. What does hail sound like against certain objects? I think that could be fascinating. And we can use GoPros to do this. So it's kind of the same idea where we use those guys right there, that box for studying hurricanes, the cameras will still do the work. We're going to be inside the vehicle where we are nice and safe. We'll get out. We'll collect the hail that's on the ground. We'll actually have something on the back there that will collect hail in it. And we're going to try to find big hailstones, maybe a record setter. You never know. But that's going to be the crux, the focus of the hail project. If we see a tornado somewhere, great. You know, we got a camera we can put out and leave it behind and get real close. Whatever. That's all well and good, but the goal is the hail. The hail is the goal, right? So the first field expedition begins this week, and we're going to head out there. If we look at day four, this is our target area. CJ will be joining me, which is only fitting since he was there at Texas Roadhouse last year when I hatched the idea. I'll have to tell you about it another time. It was really funny how that all came about. He basically showed me a picture of a big hailstone, and I'm just like, dude, we got to figure out a way to study this, all right? And here it is. That's day four, day five, and then day six. Yeah, we're going to be right out in the thick of it, and we will be live whenever possible. And let me just give you a quick rundown of how this will work. 
The night before, I'll do a quick video just kind of outlining what we think is going to happen the next day. The morning of, I'll do another quick video about what we're planning to do that day. The target area, the SPC guidance, some of the models, whatever, kind of laying it all out. What do we think is going to happen? Where do we think the biggest hail is going to happen? Then, what will we accomplish or hope to accomplish during said hail events? One or two, three supercells, whatever we can get into. After we're done, we get back to the hotel, wherever that may be. And as long as we don't have some kind of a record stone that we need to get to the local weather service office, we go back to the hotel, we grab all the GoPro video, take all the pictures. I spend the next three or four hours editing together about a five-minute recap that I have ready the next morning. And then the cycle starts all over again. I do another video. Hey, here's what we're expecting today. We go out. We do what we do. We make a video of what we got. Post that the next morning. You see? It just goes on and on and on. So rapid fire stuff, keeping you in the loop, live when we can, lots of amazing content. We get to see Hale do what it does using technology, and it's going to be something else. I mean, wow. I can't wait to do it. I appreciate all the people that have helped to fund this and make it happen. It's all through Patreon and, of course, our relationship with Fox Weather. That is a big help as well, and they're outlining it there will be doing some stories with them, live with them when we can. What a great partnership to study and bring you this phenomenon, again, that few people really understand until it happens to them. And then it's like, ugh, hail of all things, right? Right. All right, so there you go. Covered some hurricane stuff. Nothing to worry about now. But once we get into May, and that's just a little over a week away, right? Yeah, it is. May is next week. Yes, so we have to be ready. And then, of course, the Hale Project begins, and uh, I hit the road later today. All right, let me get this online for you. Don't forget, we are supported through Patreon. That's our crowdfunding and a great community overall. That helps with the money, yes, but it's also a terrific, absolute amazing community. I have crowdsourced a bunch of ideas from that. And then we are at Hurricane Track on YouTube and Twitter, or whatever they're calling it these days. That's where we are, and on Facebook, but... I mostly do the YouTube and the Twitter. All right? From all of us at Hurricane Track, that's the brand. I am Mark Suddeth. We appreciate you tuning in. I'll see you again probably sometime Wednesday from out in Texas as we go to track down some big-time hail.